Welcome back, everyone, to Drunk Bible Study Bonus Edition. Here we are with the first week of Lamentations. It's going to be the first part of a two-parter. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, the two of you really didn't know very much about this book going into it, which is kind of the norm these days. Once we hit the New Testament, I'm sure you'll know everything. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. But right now... Maybe. I also feel like a lot of my knowledge is about the four Gospels, mm, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll be hitting that first, at least. And yes. then maybe it'll peter out. And like some yeah. of Acts, and then random stuff from Paul's letters. But yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that we also that we think we know. Mm. Kind of like back when we were doing you know Genesis and Exodus and stuff, where it's like, I think I know... But then you read the rest of the story and you're like, oh, huh. Whoa. There's a lot of other details that are kind of weird or messed up or different than I thought they were. Yeah, that took a turn. Yeah. Exactly. So that'll be interesting. So it, to help us all out with the comprehension of this, because let's face it, it was a little bit difficult to understand in places. There were colons everywhere. My goodness. <laughs> and it, it just, it, yeah, a lot of calling... Israel and Jerusalem, a woman, and talking about all the ways that she was getting killed or or something, and that she's a widow and a Shunned. bunch. Yes. yes. So, so can you tell us a little bit about that, about lamentations in general? Yeah. So, so first of all, something that may have contributed to some of the weirdness is that the first four chapters, so the, the first two that we're going to read next week, as well as the two we read today, are all acrostic poems. Uh, oh. Just like Psalm 119 or whatever it was that we read that was all that big acrostic poem. Okay. This, this one's just not like spelled out with you know chapter headings. So yeah, so chapters one, two, and four each have 22 verses, which is you know one for each of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And the first line begins with that first letter. Oh. And then chapter three, which we're going to start with next time, has 66 verses. And so each letter gets three verses in a row that start with that letter. I didn't notice that at all. Well, it's all lost on us in English because yeah. basically mm -hmm. no one has tried to replicate that in English. According to the Wikipedia, there are two translations that have tried to do it, but there's only 22 verses. So both of them just go from A to V and leave out WXYZ at the end. Oh, so it's like, interesting. well, I mean, what else are you going to do, right? Yeah. Anyway, I haven't, I didn't look up those translations or anything, but they do exist. It's Ronald Knox and David R. Slavitt have tried to make acrostic versions. Hmm. And then the other weird character is that it follows a particular uh, like rhythmic pattern, you know, kind of like Shakespeare did all the iambic pentameter stuff like that. Hmm. These all have a rhythm that's called a kakina. Kina? Kina? It's a Q I N A H. Kina. Hmm. Or something like that. Okay. Kina. And it's, I guess it's like three stresses followed by two. That's what it says here. I don't really know what that means, but. Two what? Followed by two what? Two, I, I don't know. Two something else. <laughs> this is my favorite part, though. And, and I do think this does characterize some of what we read. So Dobbs Alsop describes this meter as, quote, the rhythmic dominance of unbalanced and enjambled lines. Enjambled? Enjambled. I mean, it feels pretty enjambled to That's me. That's almost as good as dandle, like endandled, right? enjambled. Endandled. I love it. Enjambled. I just, or en enjambed. Enjambled. Sorry, there's no L. Enjambed. 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 Oh, I liked enjambled no better. But enjambled is more fun, for sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Wow. Uh, anyway, so so that contributes to the the structure. A couple other things I wanted to say, though, just uh, we talked a little bit about the kind of timing of it, that it's a lament about the fall of Jerusalem. What's interesting, though, is that from a literary point of view, it follows a structure that's similar to the Sumerian laments of the second millennium BCE. So like, 2,000 years before this. Wow. So this is actually kind of calling on like a much older tradition from the area mm. of these lamentations. So, so, for example, there's the lamentation about the destruction of Ur. Uh, there's one for the lamentation of Sumer and you know, stuff like that. So this is kind of drawing on that tradition. However, mm -hmm. in all those stories, the lamentation was written at the time that they were rebuilding the city. 
And so they all have happy endings. Oh. But this one was written before it was rebuilt, so it doesn't. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, and then also that this book is really not one piece, really. Like each of the chapters are not chronologically in order of any kind. They're all just sort of different things, which leads us to the last thing I thought was interesting is about who wrote it. So traditionally, it's Jeremiah. But basically, it's just because there was this trend at some point in history to attribute all of the unknown books to some sort of, you know, biblically inspired author we've heard of. That's why we attribute so many things to Solomon or to Moses Mm. or Mm. Jeremiah or whatever. So they're like, just because it was about stuff that happened during his time, it's not really, there's really nothing about it to say that he actually wrote any of these. Hmm. So the modern theory is that they're probably all written by different people and that they were formed together later. One of the pieces of evidence for why they're different from each other is that they're all very different. So for example, Jerusalem is personified as a woman in these first two chapters that we read. Yeah. In chapter three, it's a man. And in the fourth and fifth chapters, there it's like an eyewitness report of seeing Jerusalem be destroyed. Oh. Huh. Huh. So they're all kind of in a different voice with sort of different personifications of stuff. However, evidence for why people said, no, they are the same author is the fact that so many of them are acrostics and they have a lot of kind of similarities in terms of style and vocabulary and theology. So maybe they were just like, they got together a little coalition of different poets, wrote something. They're like, hey, what if we all wrote acrostics? Hmm. And then the, the fifth person just kind of was like, that was too hard. I didn't do it. Or something. I don't, I don't I know. I love that, though. <laughs> like, you know what? No, we're, I'm going to break away from the mold. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Fascinating. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, but again, I knew nothing about this book. Mm. Like, I literally, if you had told me this book was in the Bible, I would have been like, huh, really? Is it? Like, I didn't know anything about it. Did you, Dedeker? No, I was just like, sounds like it's a bummer. And I don't think <laughs> I remember ever reading it or, or having it ever cited. Yeah. Maybe that was it, that I saw it and was like, mm, that sounds like a bummer. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we want to talk about some Psalms, right? Yeah. These songs of ascents. So these uh, 15 psalms that are the songs of ascents, I mentioned they were probably people on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, a lot of scholars believe that they were sung while people were like on that road, on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And there were three pilgrim festivals that would happen. So like, I guess people from the outlying areas might have sung these while they were on their way in. Also, theories are that they were sung at the building of the temple or that they were sung at, uh, of Solomon's temple, that is specifically, or that they were for rebuilding Jerusalem's walls or you know various other things like that. Hmm. Uh, there is some references to them in other literature of the time. So they do have a pretty clear, like these were probably written during the, what was it? Six, fifth century? BCE, oh, wow. something like that. So, wow, you know, a little bit older. Maybe some got added later on. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, these are like used a lot today, and I had no idea. So, in like in Judaism, Psalm one twenty six, which was the second to last one that we read today, is recited uh, on Shabbat oh. and various Jewish holidays and festive occasions. And then Psalm 121, which we read, I think, last time or maybe two episodes ago, yeah. is a copy of it is placed in like delivery rooms and on babies' cribs to like help them what? grow up in a good, good. way. <laughs> Tell them grow up good. <laughs> grow up good. <laughs> grow up real good. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it's interesting that, that these are apparently some pretty hot Psalms, maybe because they're short. Uh, in like old school uh, monk life, I learned that it was common practice for early monks before Catholicism developed things like the, I think it's called the Book of Hours or something like that, which are like certain Psalms you read each hour each day or something like that. That back then they would read literally all of the Psalms every day. Huh. They would recite them every single day. That was like a monk oh my gosh. thing to do. Wait, all so, of them? All of them, all of them, yeah. That's, how long has it taken us to even get through this many? <laughs> right? <laughs> but you're. But remember, you're Can a you monk even... and you're really not doing anything else. You're so. a monk. 
there's not much else to do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> goodness gracious. Wow. Every oh my day. Goodness. Yeah. Oh, that's that's pretty incredible. Um. Uh, well, so I want to talk about this Psalm 127 that has this verse in it: "Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them." So, Emily, do you know who the Duggars are? Are they? Did they have a lot of children? They did. Okay. Yes. Yes. There was some scandal. Did you just guess that or, or did you remember about hearing about them? No, I feel like it was in the back of my psyche somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> that mean, I knew that. And one of the, did one of them like have a big scandal? Like, yeah. 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 Yikes. One of them did some real bad stuff. We're not going to get into the Duggars today. Exactly. But, like pedophilia stuff. Yeah. 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 You got, got it. it. You got it. got it. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to see if there's the touch point here. Because there yeah, is the, a touch point. It's yeah. a mild m- miniature touch point, but it's there. That's it's okay. There in my psyche. We're not going to unpack all of the Duggar drama because that okay. would take several hours. But okay. the point is that the Duggars were part of the Quiverful movement, okay. which gets its name from this specific verse about having a quiver full of arrows. And by full of arrows, I mean full of children. A quiver full of children, <laughs> as it were. Yeah, that you will yeah. shoot out of a bow. Wow. At your yes. enemies. Um, so, what? yeah, the fundamental thinking is that God is the one who knows the right number of children for you. Uh, so, no birth control. Mm, and uh, have as many children. That's not how it works, but okay. <laughs> well, it's how it works for them. So, okay. I actually looked into sort of the background of the history of this. And so the Uh Quiverfuls, they're not the first religious movement to go here, right? Like, basically, there are a number of different religious movements that use, I guess, what's termed the internal growth model. So as in the way that we grow our religion is not through trying to convert people. It's not through missionary work. It's through creating more of us. It's through having kids. So most famously, like Orthodox Jews or like Hasidic Jews, that's the model, right? Hasidic Jews are oh. not going out trying to proselytize and trying yeah. to convert. You just have a bunch of kids. Got it. And okay. same thing uh, with like the Mennonites, um, certain Amish communities, and same with the Quiverful, which is kind of like the particular Christian flavor of this. So when we talk about religious approaches to birth control, that's also a long and complicated history, as it were. Like... Do it in the butt. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let me say that. On I was show. not expecting you to go there. That, yeah, that I did not okay, expect yes. That. Okay. That is part of the long and complicated history. That's not where I was going. I've heard that from my boyfriend before. That that apparently was okay. Okay. Yes. That's okay. That's a whole other branch of this history that maybe we'll explore some other time. But but basically, I'm talking about the fact that you know historically the Christian Church has not been a huge fan of birth control. However, specifically in the 1930s was when there was an Anglican conference that where the the Anglican Church finally was like, you know what, birth control is actually okay. Cool. Like we'd prefer if people were abstinent. Yeah. But if you're if you're still using birth control in light of Christian principles, as they put it, then it's probably okay. And so that was sort of the starting point for most other Protestant doctrines to be like, okay, birth control is probably okay, right? And so that leaves generally certain groups of Catholics and the quiverful people who are very anti-birth control, right? So the roots of this movement do start as kind of a pushback to the, you know, like second wave feminism, I think, you know, in like the 60s and 70s and, and early 80s, where that's when specifically this woman, um, Nancy Campbell, starts publishing st- very, very anti-feminist stuff, mm. you know, about how, no, actually, you should be a stay-at-home mom. That's what God wants for you. You need to have as many children as possible. So that's kind of where the early roots of the Quiverful movement start. And then it kind of just took off in these particular little sects of like, you know, very conservative Christian people homeschooling their kids, people who are doing homesteading out in rural areas and things like that. I guess they thought that the Duggars were one of those like, we had eight kids at once because we were doing IVF. No, not one of those. Nope. Got it. Not at all. And actually, here's the funny thing that I found. IVF is not okay for some people. 
Well, so actually, it seems like for some adherents in the quiverful movement, no, inf- infertility is not okay. Because really, it's all about God's ultimate authority in how many children you have. And so, infertility. And so if he says no, you can't. Then you can't. Got it. So you yeah. can't inter- intervene. If he I says say. no, you don't. Maybe you pray because... Yeah, because maybe he'll change his mind because that happens in the Bible, in the Old Testament, right? That like we talk about these women who are barren, can't have children, then suddenly they do, you know? So Was it Rachel or Leah? One of the two of them. Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. Rachel, And also... Leah was having all the kids and Rachel was jealous, but then finally she had some kids. Yeah, also Elizabeth as well. Um, You know, pro-adoption sometimes because, you know, there's kind of the whole Christian colonial thing of like, oh, we can also save people by adoption and bring more people into the faith in that particular way. That seems to be the bottom line right at this particular moment in time. Yeah, yeah. So so that's the whole thing with the Quiverful movement. And we could do a much deeper dive into the problems with this, the problematic nature of this, all of the other kind of weird, uncomfortable things that they believe as well. But I got a lot of joy out of going to quiverful.com because my one of my favorite parts of doing the bonus episodes is going to the like websites that are straight out of the 90s and that have oh, stayed yeah. in the 90s. And yeah, quiverful.com is definitely one of those. And one of my favorite parts is there's a page on quiverful.com where it's specifically a long article that was written in 2001 Wow. That's detailing all of the horrible things that will ha- will happen to your body if you get a vasectomy. Uh, and Oh, interesting. Yes, like all of the horrible horrible things that are going to happen. You cannot, they kind of make the argument that like if you have a fire hose and you suddenly like rupture that fire hose, what's going to happen? Because that's exactly how your testicles work. It's like a fire hose at all times. Whoa, Duggar's DVD set. DVD Um, set. Okay, that's fine. Oh my gosh. Gracious. What I also like is then there's this huge, long, bulleted list where it says, this is all it says. Studies and cases have described findings of increased incidences of many disorders, including, and it gives a really long list, everything from the stuff that you might you think maybe that's reasonable, like, you know, testicular pain or some kind of cysts forming. But it keeps going all the way to lung cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, (laughs) personality disturbances, diabetes, hypoglycemia, narcolepsy. Like, and I'm just like, really? All of this? from just getting a vasectomy. He does not cite his sources. He does not cite any sources, really. So, but I thought that was fun. I mean, I can say I I have not noticed any of these symptoms myself Mm. with my vasectomy. Yeah, I was wondering. I went through this list and I was like, I don't, the only person, well, the only person that I know intimately who has a vasectomy, (laughs) I don't see any of these. Yeah. I don't see any personality disturbances, at least not yet. Yeah, but... I am realizing that now, basically, any complaint or weirdness that I ever experience, I now have a thing I can blame it on. I'd be like, oh, it's just my vasectomy acting up. Don't worry about yeah. it. Or, yeah, you or know. you know, if you're complaining about me being grumpy, I'm like, I can't help it. It's my vasectomy. It's making my personality weird yeah. or, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, so... I'm into that <laughs> excuse. Normally, I'd be kind of a live and let live kind of guy. But... You know, literally, I think Nancy Campbell, who is one of the foundational kind of authors that helped inspire some of this movement. I mean, she's like, yeah, imagine if we all had 10 kids and then all those 10 kids had 10 kids, like we'll take over the entire Senate in like three generations. And I'm like, oh, boy. I just want to say one last thing that the quiverful window decal of multiple fish and little fish coming out. It's really amazing <laughs> and it looks like a lot of sperm. Is that a thing? Oh no. I didn't know that was a thing. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, there's yeah, a thing. If fun. you go to, if you click on books and resources and go down to like halfway through, you'll see uh-huh. it. You'll see it. It's it's amazing. That's great. Well, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, wow. It is like just all, okay. All right. Yeah, all kinds of little I mean, swimmers. A, I mean, there it's a are. fire hose of fish sperm. Just yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> flying out. Amazing. <laughs> well, flying out. I always populate the Senate. <laughs> I always learn so much on this show. That was wonderful. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to have a quiz next week. Eee. 
where we get to go through Lamentations again and try to remember all of the sad stuff that was in it and (laughs) stuff about quivers. But yes, we will see you all next week. Thank you for joining us and we'll enjoy next week's quiz with you. Bye.